on the connections of the physical sciences by Mary Somerville. It has been necessary to select from the whole circle of the sciences a few of the most obvious of those proximate links which connect them together. It has been necessary to select from the whole circle of scientific art and artistic society a few of those with the closest connections to Mary Somerville. Oh, many instances might be given in illustration of the immediate connection of the physical sciences. Many instances might be given in illustration of Mrs. Somerville's connections to scientists. Oh. <laughs> For example, over by the mantelpiece, the electromagnetic Michael Faraday. And hovering at the piano, George Airy, the Astronomer Royal, no less, conversing with fellow astronomers William and John Herschel. Isn't Caroline Herschel here? Ah, and Mr. Turner and Sir Walter Scott are admiring Mrs. Somerville's paintings. Oh, I shall never forget the charm of this little society, especially the supper parties at Abbotsford, when Scott was in the highest glee, telling amusing tales, ancient legends, ghost and witch stories. Look, Sir David Brewster, he has brought his kaleidoscope with him. He reflects all our sentiments when he describes Mrs. Somerville as certainly the most extraordinary woman in Europe. Uh, a mathematician of the very first rank with all the gentleness of a woman. Ah, oh look, and there is the great geologist, Roderick Murchison. No, no, I, I really think you must mean his wife, Charlotte Murchison. Look, the circles of men may feature in the head but in the shadows stand the most important connections, a network of women which, like many through history and now, sustain and reflect each other's brilliance. So, let's begin again. On the connections of the physical sciences by Mary Somerville. This is a landmark book. The beginning of a new way of thinking about the sciences. A book written within the realms of domesticity and duty. <clears throat> rose early and made such arrangements with regard to my children and family affairs that I had time to write afterwards. Not, however, without many interruptions. A man can always command his time under the plea of business. A woman is not allowed any such excuse. <clears throat> But how did you manage to keep your scientific writing hidden for so long, even from your closest friend? Well, frequently I hid my papers when someone came to the door, lest anyone should discover my secret. <clears throat> as soon as my work was finished, I sent the manuscript to Lord Brum, requesting that it might be thoroughly examined, criticised and destroyed according to promise, if a failure. Imposter syndrome? seems to have affected her just as it still does many women even today but it was not a failure oh no quite the contrary its author became a celebrity in victorian london <laughs> and it led to her being named the queen of the sciences she's even on our 10 pound notes the first royal woman to be there in scotland but it wasn't her education that brought her success. There was little enough of that. No, no, no. This was her insatiable curiosity that built the success, something which stayed with her throughout her life. As her daughter Martha said, As a lonely child, she wandered by the seashore and on the links of Burnt Island, collecting shells and flowers, or spent the clear, cold nights at her window watching the starlit heavens whose mysteries she was destined one day to penetrate in all their profound and sublime laws making clear to others that knowledge which she herself had acquired at the cost of so hard a struggle i mean to make the laws of the material world familiar to my country women Oh, this 
song has nothing to do with Mary Somerville. Well, unless you count the eight versions of it collected by Sir Walter Scott, our great friend. No, this has more to do with its composer, Mary Dare. Or Mary, Queen of Scots, of course. Like her, Mary Somerville was very proud of her appearance. Yes, the notwithstanding my love of science, I like to be at and rest for a queen. And Mary beaten and Mary Carmichael. The two women had ships named after him, after them, and strangely, they were lost at sea within a few years of each other. And it is with the sea that Mary Somerville's story really begins. Her father was an admiral, and though she was born inland, she spent most of her life at the coast in Burnt Island as a child. She was surrounded by beautiful things, and she ran a little bit wild, exploring everything above and below the waves and the earth itself. She was awash with curiosity. Listen, for a lost word, mourners hear, for the cord now shall, and say far away the bluffers blare and the sea birds scream and the sea birds scream. The ship carrying her name worked twenty years between London, Canton and Calcutta before it was noticed. And the wheel, oh woman, a lie on shore, where the swell comes rowing in, and the swirly waters wumbling o'er the cry of the sea. Willie Souter's words and Isabel Dunlop's music would not have been known to her. There was a hundred years to wait for that. But the language was in the air and the music resounded from the waters of the Forth. <laughs> Everything was collect connected for Mary Somerville. The sciences and the arts. She, in fact, practised the piano for hours every day as a young woman and was, by all accounts, very accomplished. She was a painter too, and made a great portrait of herself as a very, very grand lady of, of perfect vision of womanhood, a scientist, a mother, and a proud supporter of the British Empire as the engine for progress in the world. <laughs> How different things would have been for her if her first husband, Mr. Gregg, had lived. Unlike her second very supportive husband, he had put a stop to her curiosity. Mr. Gregg took no interest in science or literature and possessed in full the prejudice against learned women, which was common at that time. During this marriage, she'd been very unhappy and lonely in London and often thought about her childhood home in Scotland, just as Lord Byron dreamt of his childhood home in his poem Loch Nagar and his daughter Ada Lovelace, a pupil of Mary Somerville's, longed for him. <laughs> this setting of that poem in the year that Mary's husband had died, well it must have been known to her, it was written in that year and this setting of it by the Scottish harpist and composer Isabella Scott Gibson a distant relative of Sir Walter's. Well, she must have heard it. Away, ye gay 
landscapes, ye garden of roses, in you let the minions of luxury rove. Restore me the rocks where the snowflake reposes, yet still art they sacred to freedom and love. O oh, brave Caledonia, beloved are thy mountains, round their white summits the elements war. The cataracts foam, instead of smooth flowing fountains, I sigh for the valleys of dark Loch Nagar. Years have rolled on Loch Nagar since I left you. Years must elapse till I see you again. Nature of verdure and flowers has bereft you. Yet still art thou dearer than Albion's plain. O oh, England, thy beauties are pale and domestic to one who has roved in the mountains afar. Oh, for the crags that are wild and majestic, the steep flowing glories of dark Loch Nagar. Oh, brave Caledonia, beloved are thy mountains, round their white summits the elements war. The cataracts foam, instead of smooth flowing fountains, I sigh for the valleys of dark Loch Nagar. I kept up a correspondence with Lady Noel Byron and Ada as long as they lived. Ada was much attached to me and often came to stay with me. It was by my advice that she studied mathematics. She always wrote to me for an explanation when she met with any difficulty. Among my papers, I lately found many of her notes asking mathematical questions. I am working, I am working very hard. I said there will, in fact, I think you will be pleased.
That brain, that brain of mine, is something more than, something more than mortal, as time will show. That brain, that brain of mine, is something more than, something more than, more than mortal. Devils in it, I not sucked out, sucked out the life blood from the mysteries of the universe. I am working, I am working. That brain is something more than mortal. I am working very hard, very, very hard. As time, as time will show, time will show. Scientific music. I am working very, very hard. Elaborate and scientific music. That brain of mine, I am working, is something more than mortal. I think you will be pleased. Lady Lovelace has been fascinated by machines since childhood, becoming passionate about maths after Mrs. Somerville introduced her to Charles Babbage. Ah, talk of the devil. There you are, Babbage. Were you not working on your difference engine at that time? Ah, indeed, my calculating machine which generates mathematical tables quickly and most accurately. Lovelace later translated a paper in Italian about Babbage's next invention, the analytical engine, which was an early forerunner of our modern computers. The analytical engine weaves algebraical patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. <gasps> she added extensive notes outlining the possibility of writing a computer program so that a machine could direct its own calculations independently of human intervention and which could potentially create its own music. The analytical machine never materialized, but uh, as the first person to have written a computer program, Ada Lovelace acts as an inspiration to generations of women working in computing. Will you give me poetical science? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Engine number one. Poetical science. Ah, oh, yes. Systematic engine number two. Jacquard, 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 
The analytical machine is not merely adapted for tabulating the results of one particular function and of no other, but for developing and tabulating any function whatever. It is desirable, it is desirable to guard. Guard? Guard against the possibility, possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as to the power, as to the power of the analytical machine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Zero minus one equals one. minus one. one. Equals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Zero. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, eight, two, nine. Three, four. One, two, three, eight, four, nine. five, six, seven, eight, nine. Zero. One plus one equals one. Zero minus one equals minus one. Zero times one equals one. Zero divided by one equals one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, five, six, five, six. Before World War Two. People used mechanical calculators to do long and complex calculations. These people were mainly women. These women were known as computers. Scottish astronomer Wilhelmina Fleming was the first of a famous group of human computers. Calculated the position of the stars. By reading photographic black and white plates of light spectra. Taken from a telescope, they were never allowed to look through. Nina Fleming the stars. Discovered the horsehead nebula. Two hundred variable stars. And a great deal more. Good. Ever. Mm -hmm. Analytical machine. The engine can arrange and combine its numerical quantities. Exactly, 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 as if it were letters. Colossus, Colossus. I was transfixed. Working at Bletchley Park on Colossus as code breakers. Well, they... oh, you mean uh, uh, Joan Murray, I think. Uh, oh, oh, oh. oh, yes, Margaret. Yes, I remember Margaret. And what about Betty that? Webb? Oh, yes, Jean. Oh, um, was it um, yes. oh, Ruth what? Drakes? Margaret Freeman. Uh, I think. Eugene Lewis. Yes, I Margaret think. Margaret Mortimer. Yeah. 
Yes, Why definitely. You Freeman, Margaret Atwood. Freeman Atwood. Yes, yes. They, they, were were Marianne 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 yes. they were confined to narrow tasks on the assumption that they had only limited technical ability. I, th I think I think these women were much better than having limited technical ability. I think you would agree, wouldn't you? Well, I, I, this is ridiculous. Who is this man telling us that we have we have we have limited abilities, us making assumptions about us? I can't have this. Well, this is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. That haughty man, unrivaled and alone, may make the world of science all his own. As barbarous tyrants to secure us, conclude that ignorance will best obey. In 1958, there were several job adverts for men and women. Under women, there was no such thing as engineer, mathematician, computer programmer, or anything like that. It is desirable. It is desirable. To guard, guard, guard against the possibility, possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as to the power, as to the power of the analytical machine small enough to sit on your desk. <laughs> Stephanie Shirley set up a software company to employ young mothers working from home. I had else. this idea first this that idea. software was more important. <laughs> Where are they now? Where are they now? Where Your are they now? Small enough to sit on your lap. I was really worried about all these men programming. I thought this was women's work. Ma, ma, ba, 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 ba. I'm sorry. I, um, I have one that's small enough to sit on my hand. Oh. <laughs> Can you believe that? Oh. for tabulating the results of one particular function and of no other, but for developing and tabulating any function whatever. Gradually, 
never be a thing of one particular moment. I depart, whither I know not. Lord Byron's words to his daughter. Fair child, Ada, sole daughter of my house and heart, as he crossed the channel never to return. He wasn't much of a father, and neither, come to think of it, was Mrs. Somerville's father, though unlike Byron, he was clearly an upright and sensible man. His long absences at sea and her mother's neglect gave her the freedom to explore her surroundings as a child, and their disapproval of her intellectual inquiries forced her to secretly study after dark. I see the moon and the moon sees me. I see the moon and the moon sees me. God I see the bless the moon and the moon sees me. God bless me. God I see the bless moon the moon and the moon sees me. God bless me. me. God bless me. the moon and the moon and God bless me. me. astonished at the success of my book, The Mechanism of the Heavens. I was elected an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society at the same time as Miss Caroline Herschel. Do 
be associated with so distinguished an astronomer was in itself an honour. Oh, I was sorry to hear that Miss Herschel was absent when you visited the Herschels in Slough. Yes, though Sir William showed me his manuscripts, which recorded the numerous astronomical discoveries he'd made. They were all arranged in the most perfect order. System, oh. systematic, systematic order. She it was, systematic order, who arranged everything in systematic order. She it was who noted the right ascensions and polar distances of the objects observed, and who added luster to the name she bore by her eminence in astronomical knowledge and discovery. I've heard that Miss Herschel discovered eight comets using her own small telescope, somehow squeezing her personal observations into the very limited time she had outside of her duties to her brother. Mm. Ah, listen, listen, listen. I think they're singing one of Sir William's own compositions. Though it may well have been Caroline's, Stop! she was forced to abandon her burgeoning career as a singer when her brother Stop! decided to give up music we astronomy. Sing a catch. There was much talk of her wonderful singing of Handel, we much sing as we talk now of our great soprano Clara Novello. Oh, I've had very great delight in the beautiful singing of our friend Clara Novello, who used to come to my house and sing Handel to me. It was a real pleasure, and her voice was as pure and silvery as when I first heard her years before. Miss Novello is here with her father, the musician and music publisher Vincent Novello. Miss Novello and her friends have kindly agreed to sing for us. It will be a hymn by Mr. Novello's favourite lady composer, oh, Eliza Flower. Wonderful. Now pray we for our country that England long may be the holy and the happy and the glad. Bravo, brava, bravissimo. Ah, yeah. Perhaps Mr. Babbage would be so kind as to sing another Eliza Flower hymn. Yes, I'm sure our dear friend Sir Walter Scott will be amused to hear her setting of words from his latest novel, Ivanhoe. Oh, do you? <laughs> yes. How <laughs> wonderful. When Israel of the Lord be Loved out of the land of bondage came a father's God before moved an awful guiding smoke and flame by day along the astonished land. Cloudy pillar glided slow by night, Arabia's 
Those crimson sands returned the fiery columns glow. A hops we left by Babel stream, the tyrants jest the Gentile scorn. Robert Browning, hey, Robert Browning, only just now described Eliza Flower as a composer of real genius. Mm, well, she had encouraged his work when he was a child, which led him to falling in love with her. Thankfully, however, she is a good deal older than him, so his choice of bride was somewhat more suitable. Our greatest poetess, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Oh, how delicate she looks. Hello. Hello. <laughs> It's no surprise that Miss Flower was not invited to hear her music sung. I'm sure she's not at all the kind of woman that even Mrs. Somerville would want to receive. Well, quite. Her rather unusual living arrangement with that clergyman has yes. certainly caused quite a <laughs> scandal. Hey, Mr. Browning is trying out a new poem, look, with Lady Dufferin, I see. <gasps> Lady Dufferin, I do love her songs. We should sing one. How about the lament of the Irish immigrant? That's the most popular. I have a better idea. You do? Let's ask the pianist. Oh, <laughs> yes. Tell, what should we play? What should we sing? Morris? Wait for it. Uh -huh. The Charming Woman, in honour of Mrs. Somerville. Yes, of course. She may well be amused by some uncanny likenesses to her own childhood, her fascination with Euclid, and a none too flattering portrayal of her. So, Miss Myrtle is going to marry. What a number of hearts she will break. There's Lord George, Tom Brown, and Sir Harry are dying of love for her sake. Tis a match that we all must approve. Let the gossip say all that they can. For indeed she's a charming woman. And he's a most fortunate man. For indeed she's a charming woman. And he's a most fortunate man. How fortunate do you think he is? Well, you'll see, I suppose. Yes, indeed, she's a charming woman, and she reads both Latin and Greek, and I'm told that she saw.
Oh, she's really a charming girl. Splat. But I think she's a little too thin. And no wonder such a very late hours should ruin her beautiful skin. She can chatter of quarrels and tithes and the value of labor and the land. Tis a pity when charming women talk of things which they don't understand. Tis a pity when charming women talk of things which they don't understand. Oh. Oh, Morris, you're back! Oh. Look, he's back! Marvellous! Oh, where have you been? Oh, good. Sir. I know he's cup of tea and he's back. <laughs> Marcus, we'll just continue this. certainly shares your wish to see the many injustices in our society put to rights, Mrs. Yes, Somerville. He is concerned particularly with the poor in her native island, as you have been with many causes, Mrs. Somerville, over the years. Yes, indeed. When I was a girl, I took to the anti-slavery cause so warmly to heart that I would not take sugar in my tea, or indeed taste anything with sugar in it. I was not singular in this, for my cousins and many of my acquaintances came to the same resolution. Oh, now, Patty Smith, whose father was a celebrated leader in the anti-slavery question, became a great friend. And I knew her sisters, but only remember her niece, Florence Nightingale, as a small child. Oh, Miss Nightingale, she's made quite a name for herself since yes, then. Indeed. Yes. On a dark, lonely night on Crimea's dread shore, there'd been bloodshed and strife from the morning before. Some crying for help, but there's none to be found. And God in his mercy is pitied them. Rise. And the soldier so cheerful in the morning does rise. So forward, my lads, may your heart never fail. You're cheered by the presence of Miss Nightingale. You're cheered by the presence of Miss Nightingale, her heart it means good, for no bounty she'll take. She'd lay down her life for the poor soldier's sake. She prayed for the dying, gave peace. To the brave. She felt that a soldier had a soul to be saved. The wounded, they loved her as it has been seen. 
She's the soldier's preserver. They call her their queen. They call her their queen. Call her their queen. May God give her strength and her heart never fail. One of heaven's best gifts is Miss Nightingale. Oh, that was wonderful. 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 Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, another of those gifts is our own Queen of the Sciences, Mary Somerville. I'm sure you would agree, Dr. Willison. <laughs> Certainly, she has transformed our dabblings into the scientific realms, so that they are now of great benefit to so many, particularly those of the fairer sex. Oh, Mrs. Somerville, do tell us again about the day Dr. Wollaston arrived unannounced yeah. to show you one of his exciting discoveries. Well, oh, well with pleasure. <laughs> Bright morning, Dr. Wollaston came to pay us a visit in Hanover Square, saying, I have discovered seven dark lines crossing the solar spectrum, which I wish to show you. One bright morning, Dr. Wollaston came to pay us a visit in Hanover Square. Closing the window shutters so as to leave only a narrow line of light. He put a small glass prism into my hand. Seven dark lines. I saw them distinctly. Seven dark lines, the origin of the most wonderful series of cosmical discoveries. Spectrum analysis has shown that there is a vast quantity of Self-luminous gaseous matter in space. Incapable of being reduced into stars. One bright morning, Dr. Wollaston came to pay us a visit in Hanover Square, closing the window shutters so as to leave only a narrow line of light. He put a small glass prism into my hand, telling me how to hold it. Seven dark lines. I saw them distinctly. This is the matter of which the sun and stellar systems has been formed. This is the matter of which the sun and stellar systems have been found. By slow, continuous condensation. The principal constituents of this matter are the terrestrial gases, hydrogen and nitrogen. The yellow stars, like the sun, contains terrestrial matter. One bright morning, Dr. Wollaston came to pay us a visit in Hanover Square, saying, I have discovered seven dark lines crossing the solar spectrum, which I wish to show you. 
Seven dark lines to prove that many of the substances of our globe seven dark lines of the sun, the stars, seven even dark of the lines. One of the most important uses of the atmosphere is the conveyance of sound. Without the air, death-like silence would prevail through nature. Undulations received by the air, such as the vibrations of a musical chord. Sweet part of song that canst impart to Lawrence Wayne on mountain the gladness thrilling through the heart a joy so Sweet pa that makes youthful heads with this on shamrock crowned and proudly as the carol sheds its spirit through. Gentle breast, breast. 
is indeed the master of song. Oh, we have both always loved the old Scots songs, <laughs> and her words to this tune were very fitting. So good of Herr Beethoven to arrange the music for her. Quite. <laughs> Particularly Mrs. Somerville, as you are so passionate about playing his music yourself. <laughs> it is certainly true that Bailey excels as a poet but perhaps not so well as a playwright. <laughs> she is a dear and valued friend, of course, but Miss Bailey's plays, though highly poetical, are not <laughs> suited for the stage. Ah, oh, Miss Bailey. Ah, ah, ah. Princess Somerville. Mary, <laughs> your book on the connections of the physical sciences confirms my belief that you are one who has done more to remove the light estimation in which the capacity of women is too often held than all that has been accomplished by the whole sisterhood of poetical damsels and novel writing authors. Do you not agree, Mr. Mill? Uh, in, indeed. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. I Marvellous. But... The British laws are adverse to women, and we are deeply indebted to you, Mr. Mill, for oh, daring to show well. their iniquity and injustice. The law in the United States, you know, is, is, is in some respects even worse, granting suffrage to the newly emancipated slaves and refusing it to the most highly educated women of the Republic. Mm. Ah, I see Amelia is looking for me. Uh, would you excuse me? Of course. Of course. Mrs. Opie is such a dedicated abolitionist. They must have much to discuss. Uh, I, I think so, yes, that's it. Oh, Jane Bianchi is going to sing for us now. I believe it probably is one of her own settings. Winter's beautiful rose. I have heard that Miss Bianchi was paid the very handsome sum of £126 for singing at the concerts of ancient music. Goodness me. No. Those concerts, you know, Mrs. Somerville described as the resort of the aged, a young face scarcely to be seen. She oh. thought the music perfect, but the whole affair rather dull. Checkered leaves, it's gold checkered 
they describe her deep friendship with our hostess. Yeah, yes. yes, but I'd wager that many of her friends feel quite the same. Oh yes, but Mr Somerville must of course be included in this and he has always supported, encouraged and promoted her scientific pursuits. Mary Lyle's husband Charles once commented that had our friend Mrs Somerville been married to a mathematician we should have never heard of her work. Mm. She would have merged it with her husband's and passed it off as his. Yet that is precisely what he did with his own wife's work on shells. Mm. Sadly, this is not an unusual case. Mary Buckland's son remarked that she materially assisted her husband in his literary labours and often gave to them a polish which added not a little to their merit. Mm. You know, it was Mrs Somerville herself who reminded me that Lady Murchison had taken to the study of geology and soon after her husband began that career which has rendered him the first geologist of our country. Geologists had excited public attention and had shocked the clergy and the more scrupulous of the laity by proving beyond a doubt that the formation of the globe extended through enormous periods of time. Raising horizons! Raising horizons! Raising horizons! Uh -huh. So she's singing Annie Laurie. It was written by Alicia Ann Scott, who mastered the science of harmony and acquired an accurate knowledge of botany, geology, and especially archaeology. Hedy Scott lived close to Somerville's old friend Sir Walter Scott in Abbotsford in the Scottish borders and shared his and Mrs Somerville's love of the local culture. I imagine this song living within our Somerville connections. Charlotte Murchison singing it with Mary Lyle as they sketch and collect fossils together, while Mary Buckland teaches the song to their friend and most admired paleontologist, Mary Anning, while they examine her latest fossil discovery. Archaeology, that's us. Archaeology, geology, 
Paleontology, that's us. Archaeology, geology, paleontology, that's finding footprints of the past. Wait, that's us. In every item, geology. In every kind of some is a story of the is a story Charlotte Murchison taught her husband the geology he was Mary Lyle's husband took all the credit for her and her sister's work on shell collection. Mary Buckland's husband disapproved of women publicly engaging in science despite relying on her knowledge of science. Despite her expertise being recognised throughout Europe, Mary Anning had to sell her fossils just to survive. She suffered grinding poverty most of her life. Time and tide and tectonics, wait for no woman. Time and tide and tectonics, wait for no woman. Above the surface of the earth, the noise of the tempest ceases and the thunder is heard no more in these boundless regions where the heavenly bodies accomplish their periods in eternal and sublime science. For aught we know, myriads of bodies may be wandering in space and seen by us, of whose nature we can form no idea.
Thank you.